The Incorruptible Seed Part 1. I am going to express some things in this writing that may perhaps be new to you. Hopefully they will be confirmations to what the Lord has been showing you. Or perhaps you will just know that it is the truth by the anointing that is within you. If not then just put it on the shelf to perhaps look at again at another time. When you begin to experience spiritual things, you can find it very difficult to try to put into words that which you experience in the spirit. And as always, when spiritual truths began to be expressed, they are normally always extremely opposed by religious people who are trapped in a mindset and not willing to see things different. I am not interested in just another teaching or a revelation but I want the reality of all that I know to be wrought into my experience. Experience. For instance I know that I am complete in him. There is nothing I need to do or can do from my own strength to complete the work in me. However, I do not just want the knowledge of my completeness but I want to walk practically in that knowledge until I am fully and experientially walking in the completeness. I know that I am healed and in perfect health but to just know that intellectually will not help the pain or heal the body. We must keep reaching into the spiritual realm and bring into manifestation by the spirit that which we know to be the truth. Like Abraham we cannot consider our body as good as dead but we must consider him faithful who has promised. We must be prepared at all cost to share the truth of what we know to be the truth as the Lord leads. One of the things I always caution people about is this. Do not be afraid to hear something that sounds contrary to what you believe. The only way that God can progressively bring us into more understanding and revelation is that we must trust him and know that as we are seeking truth he will lead us and guide us into all truth. God is bringing us into a such an awareness of his voice and his presence that we no longer need to fear being deceived. I always share wherever I go 1 John 2 20 you have an anointing and you know all things. When we begin to hear spiritual truths, although they may be foreign to our understanding and our thinking, there will be something in us that resonates to it. Maybe we can't quite understand it and have never seen it that way, but we know it's the truth. That's what the anointing does for you. It bypasses your natural understanding. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that word in the Strong's is Logos, and it means, a spoken word. In the beginning was the spoken word, and in the beginning before anything existed in this realm we live in, there was the Word. And we must understand that by the Word was all things brought into existence and spoken into being. John 1 verse 3 5. All things were made by Him, the spoken word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and that word life is Zoe which is the highest form of life. In Him was God's life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That word comprehended means perceived, and it also means that the darkness was not able to overtake the light. So God has shined in the darkness, and the darkness was not able to either extinguish the light or perceive the light. Col 1 13 16 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in earth visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him, and for him. Back in the very beginning before all things God began to speak, and everything he spoke came into being, and everything that exists today in reality came out of the spoken word of God, whether it be principalities, whether it be powers, whether it be dominions, whether it be things in heaven or things on the earth, all things it says were created by him, and for him. God formed himself in man most have forgotten their beginning, but in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 26, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. The word God in this verse is the word in Strong's OT 430 Elohim, Elohim plural. Who do you think God was talking to when he said let us I believe this is a key in our understanding of who we are and where we came from. We were there in the beginning. This is what God was saying to get Job to remember when he said to him, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth declare, if thou hast understanding. Job 38, 4 when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job 38, 7, we were the sons of God shouting for joy at the creation that was being brought forth. What God actually did is he imaged himself in man. In Genesis chapter 2, it says God formed man. The word form is OT 3335 Yatsa, Yotsa, through the squeezing into shape, to mold into a form, especially as a potter, figuratively, to determine, that is form a resolution. We were the Elohim in Genesis chapter 1 and were formed by squeezing into shape. The Elohim imaged himself in man by forming himself in a man of the earth. Zechariah 12, 1 says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundation of the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Man is a visible expression of the invisible God. Now that hasn't changed. But what has changed is our perception of ourselves because we have forgotten who we are. In Genesis chapter 2 it says, God formed man from the dust of the ground. And then it says, He breathed into man the breath of life. Well we know that the word breath is the same word as spirit. And literally what Elohim did is, He formed his spirit into that body in Genesis chapter 2. That man was a visible expression of the invisible God. And I assure you that has never changed. What has changed is our perception of what God created us to be in the beginning. Who told you, you were naked if you remember in the garden. After Adam and Eve began to live by the knowledge of of good and evil. They recognized they were naked. When they partook of the fruit, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it made them lose sight of who they were. And when God came to them, Adam said, we were naked, and we hid ourselves. And God said one of the most astounding things. He said, who told you, you were naked? What happened was, their perception of who they were had changed. Because God said to them, the day you eat this fruit you will die. This remains true to this very day. The very moment you begin to live by the knowledge of choosing the good over the evil, the perception of yourself is not real. You die spiritually. Lose your perception of your true self. You do not know who you are and you feel estranged from God so you try to regain a sense of well being by living by the knowledge of good and evil. And the lies by the serpent to get Eve to eat that fruit was by telling her, if you eat this, you'll be like God. She should have responded by saying, but we are like God. You see, they were created as God on this earth. 
not something distinct and separate from God, but they were created as God over the earth. And that's why God said, let them have dominion over everything because we are the visible expression of the invisible God in a physical realm. You see, that has never changed. The wrong perception now let me tell you what that life, or that spirit was that was breathed into us. The Bible calls it a seed, because we lost the perception of who we were in God, and we have been lowered into this physical realm by physical birth. We have forgotten who we were, where we came from, and we don't know why are here. The Bible uses the illustration of a seed to tell us who we really are, because to tell a person in a darkened state of mind, in sin consciousness, weak, frail, human condition that they are God on the earth would be absolutely impossible for them to fathom. And if they did, they would receive it in their natural minds, become puffed up and prideful. So God uses the word seed. The scriptures tell us if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Now where we've missed it, or where religion has missed it, is that they've thought that the seed was only in those who went to an altar, or only in those who've said a certain prayer like, Jesus, I receive you, but you see, the seed of God is the life and light of God. The seed of God literally is God in this flesh. This is so hard for the religious mind to grasp. Once you have the revelation of being a manifestation of God on this earth, your whole life as you knew it will end. The very foundations of your existence will end because you will realize who you are, and at the same time realize that who you thought you were all your life is but a lie. You have never been alienated from God. In fact, Colossians 1.20 says, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be in earth, or in heaven, all things in heaven, and you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind, you see, the only place that Adam and Eve became alienated from God was in their minds, that is what God called, death. He said, the very day you begin to live by this knowledge of good and evil, and choosing the good over the evil, you will die, not physically, but you will die, and your perception of yourself will change. However we perceive ourselves to be is what we will manifest. That is true in all areas of our existence. If we perceive ourselves as weak, as worms of the dust, as sin-laden, as sick and diseased and tormented, as we perceive ourselves, so we become. I realize the impossibility of taking the perception of ourselves today as a human being, and change that into something godly. That whole concept of being a fallen human being must fall at our feet as though it never existed. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. WWE have taken this scripture and put people in such bondage with it. You can't smoke. You can't drink. You can't do that. That is not what he meant by denying yourself. Denying yourself is not denying the soul of all of its lust and everything that gratifies the flesh. That is not what he meant. Because you see, if you have a strong character and a strong will, you can deny everything. But that doesn't make you godly. He said, you must deny yourself. The very thought that you exist as something apart from him. The very thought that you are an individual with an individual identity separate and apart from God is what we must deny to become acquainted with our true nature. To believe that we are a separate being and alienated from God is what must be denied. When Whenever God speaks about death, that's the death he's talking about. To be in death is to be alienated in our mind from God. You see, you will never die. No one has ever died. Jesus brought life and incorruptibility to light through the gospel. Your body may fall over and never get up but you will not die. The only reason people die physically is because they perceive themselves as something other than what God is. Don't misunderstand me here. Your body that you have now will not live forever. But we do not have to go by the way of the grave. The apostle Paul says this. For we know that if our earthly house, our body of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. 2 Cor 5, 1 2 we already have a glorious body. Jesus manifested his glorious body on the Mount of Transfiguration. It is God's life in us that will swallow up all death until in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed and our present bodies will be swallowed up by our glorious bodies. Then shall come to pass the saying O death where is your sting and grave where is your victory do not get caught up into trying to make this happen. It is every man in his own order. If our bodies do go by way of the grave we will immediately be found in our eternal bodies in the heavens. The wrong perception of Jesus. We even perceive Jesus as something that we can never be. Oh we know we're supposed to be like him. We know that he was the first born among men and brethren. We know that. But why we do not experience that? What the Spirit of God is saying today to the churches is that this is the day and the hour that you are to arise from the dust of your human thinking and take your place among the sons of God. Because that is who you are. Jesus is not someone who you are not like. Everything he did we can do as the Spirit leads. We have perceived him as a divine son of God, but we are less. However the scriptures boldly declare that he is the firstborn among men and brothers and that he is bringing men and sons into glory. We have to go back to the very beginning to see this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. And anything that he didn't make does not exist in reality. I'm not saying it doesn't exist in your mind. But you see, we are very powerful human beings. And how we perceive things, and how we believe things, determines what we experience. In Galatians 3.16 it says this, Now unto Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And then he goes on to say in verse 29, And if you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. And as according to the promise, my heart's cry these days is, Give your people an expression, an impartation, that these things might be imparted unto all your people. If you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed. Let's go back again to the creation. What God breathed into man was really a spiritual being. The man of Genesis chapter 1 was breathed into this body that was made from the dust of the ground. And he calls that life the seed. Only because you have lost the knowledge and the revelation of being that one who came from God. As illustration, God begins in the Old Testament to talk about his seed. And how that through Abraham all of the families of the earth will be blessed. We have had teaching on the seed for years. But today I see it much more clearly than I did a few years ago. I used to think the seed was in us. But what we actually were was something other than a manifestation or a product of the seed. What I mean by that is this. 
Peter says that we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the living and abiding word of God. The word of God created you an incorruptible seed. The word created here does not mean to make something from nothing. It means to cut down. Strong's 1254. Peter says we are being born again. I believe it starts with being regenerated. When we're regenerated, we simply become conscious or aware of that life within us that we were dead to until that spark of life was regenerated within us. The Gospel of John says that Jesus was the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. So every man has that seed, that light of God within him. He just doesn't know it. But listen, every seed produces after its own kind. An illustration of that would be this. You have a watermelon seed with the meat of the watermelon, which could be called the soul, and you have the rind of the watermelon, which could be called the body, but they came out of the seed. Well remember, we were born of an incorruptible seed. That incorruptible seed can only produce Christ in our soul and body. But yet in our perception, we have the seed of God, but our soul and our body are something other than, or less than Christ. You know, that's impossible. It's impossible to plant an apple seed in the ground and not have that whole apple be that seed. Literally that apple seed produces an apple and nothing else but an apple. That apple seed becomes the meat and the skin. There is such a realization, a light, a glory and manifestation of God that is coming to his people to reveal, to unveil, and to remove the covering that's been cast over us. We have believed for too long the lie. We have believed too long according to how we perceive things. Now the light and the glory and the manifestation of God is coming to us, to reveal that we are an incorruptible seed. Now listen, how could you corrupt that which is incorruptible? That seed, that incorruptible seed was placed in you at birth. That's where you get your life. Life comes only from God. But we have perceived that seed as being corruptible because of what we've been taught. I often ask the question in these days, who told you? You were sinners? Who told you that you were born separate and alienated from God? Who told you that? That is what we were told since our birth. We were told that we were born sinners, that we were born alienated and separated from God. The truth is we were alienated and separated from God only in our perception. This is where the enemy was so crafty. The enemy only works according to our perception according to what we have been taught, and according to what we believe. The only thing that the enemy can do is cause you to believe that which he speaks to you. And if you believe it, you perceive it as so. It becomes so but only in your darkened mind. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we thought for years that we were corrupted. We were sinners. We were alienated from God, not realizing that we have an incorruptible seed within us. And as that seed within us grows, it cannot produce anything that's corruptible. Now I'm not telling you I'm walking experientially in the fullness of this. I'm only telling you what God has just been speaking to me recently, that we have perceived ourselves as something other than what he created us to be. And so we need light and revelation. You see, it is impossible to teach these things. The only thing we can do is stir up our remembrance because we do know all these things. We have an anointing. You have an anointing. And you know all things. 1 John 1 20. You know all things. How do you perceive that? Immediately when we hear the word of God, we can fall back into our perception of being a human and say, I don't know all things. And so you agree with the lie rather than with the truth. Yet the truth is you do know all things. And as you require the knowledge of those things, they will come to you, and you will discover that whatever you need in the way of knowledge, or whatever you need in the way of anything at all, just comes to you. And I believe that's what Jesus meant when he said, if you seek the kingdom of God first all things shall be added unto you. So if you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Well now, just who are Christ's? We can think that it's only a select few that are Christ's, but we have to remember that at Calvary he purchased all men, and all men belong to him. All men have within them, the incorruptible, indestructible seed of God, and all they need is someone who has the knowledge of God, and the experience of God to speak to that seed, and to bring it back into light, to bring it into regeneration. That's all we are doing today. We are speaking, not to the natural mind. The natural mind will never understand these things even though you may like the sound, or dislike the sound of what is being said. You will never be able to receive it with the natural mind, because, the natural man, Paul says, the carnal mind cannot receive the things of God, in fact, is an enemy of God. Well again, we're deceived because we don't realize that our good mind is an enemy of God. Because you can perceive yourself being a good person and maybe doing the right things, but that's still an enemy of God because it perceives itself as something other than what God is. You see, in our experience we may say like I did for years, that Jesus is in me, and I have the seed of God in me, but my soul and my body are something other than that because I still sin. We've been taught that we are sinners, and our souls are lost, and that's why we're processed, some for 90 years, and they die and they still never experience the fullness of God. I'll tell you what folks, the day of process has to come to an end. The only way it will come to an end is when we realize that we are the incorruptible, indestructible seed, and that seed in us cannot produce corruptibility. What we perceive with our natural mind is nothing but the lie of the enemy, and it is the seed that was planted by the enemy. Jesus said, Hear ye, in Matthew 13 18 through 23, the parable of the sower. If you remember, he said the seed was the word of God, and in the parable, he said that God has sowed good seed into the ground. Well, he did in Genesis chapter 2. He breathed his very own life into this body, and that was the good seed. We have the good seed planted in our earth. Our body is the earth where the seed of God has been planted, which assures us that we will reproduce from that seed. Everything that God is, not only in spirit, but also in soul and in body. We have believed a lie. We know we're okay spiritually, but we have thought that our souls and our bodies were corrupted. And because we've been taught that and we believe that, we experience all of the diseases and all of the sicknesses. We're just like mere men when in fact we are not mere men. We are and I hope you understand where I come from when I say this. We are God on this earth. 
and until you can accept that and you won't until you have a revelation from God. Because if you do accept it without revelation, you'll become prideful, and you know what happens to pride. We have all seen it. People running around declaring to be God, but it is just ridiculous. That's not what I'm talking about. God planted a good seed, in Genesis chapter 2, in his field. But, while men slept, the enemy came and sowed the tear. I have shared this before how the tear was simply the idea that you were something other than what God is. The tear is the seed of the serpent, the human consciousness that was also planted in the same field as the seed of Christ. So when you awoke into this lower realm, not realizing who you were and where you came from, you were immediately taught that you were a human being, that you were born in original sin. Not only your parents, but the whole universe has faith to believe that you are born a sinner. You are alienated from God, and you are separated from God. It is natural for you to be a human with all of the sinful things, and all of the hang-ups and all of the diseases, and everything else. We have accepted the same lie as Adam and Eve did. We have accepted the lie, that we are something other than what God intended for us to be. It is absolutely impossible for that seed in us to become corrupted. Neither can that seed by growing in you, produce anything other than what God is. Yet we have believed it to be so. The watermelon seed, the meat of the watermelon and the rind, are all the incorruptible seed. There is not corruptibility in God whatsoever. Now that's why Paul tells Timothy that through the gospel right now that life and incorruptibility were brought to light through the gospel. You see, we keep trying to hang on to these physical lives by whatever we can do to hang on them, not realizing that we are incorruptible. Yet because we believe we are corruptible, we do everything we can do to keep this physical thing alive. If we really understood incorruptibility, we could not possibly die. If you understand that right today, you have a perfect, magnificent, glorious body in the heavens, not up on a planet somewhere, but just a little bit higher than this consciousness that you presently live out of. You have a home, a house, a building eternal in the heavens. God today is saying, don't wait we have been waiting all of our lives for that which is within our grasp, but it takes revelation. You see, we have never changed from that which we were created to be, but because of what is called the fall we've become alienated in our minds, and we've lived the lie of the enemy, the terror, the human existence, thinking that we're waiting for God to someday come and change us from something vile into something glorious. What we have all been waiting for all of our lives is within our reach. Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. It has always been at hand. This earthly human mentality is called in scriptures, the Antichrist, and the man of sin. How many Christians do you know who are waiting for this man of sin to be revealed, that is going to rule the earth? It is impossible. There will never be another world ruler known as the Antichrist who will come into existence. If you understand Daniel's prophecy, it is impossible for another world kingdom other than the kingdom of God filling this earth. Antichrist is only between the ears of a darkened mind and understanding. Antichrist is that image of yourself that was planted in this field, this temple of God, that you are, declaring itself to be God, not submitting itself to the scripture and the righteousness of God. What does Paul say about the Antichrist? He says, in 2 Thess 2, 8 and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When Christ shall appear in you, that Antichrist will be destroyed destroyed by the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his appearing. The moment God, by the power of his spirit begins to appear in this temple, the brightness of his coming begins to destroy the concepts you have of being a fallen human being. When the light of God begins to penetrate the darkness of our understanding we begin to experience his life rise up within us and what was once a miracle to us becomes so natural. It is so easy to live a holy consecrated life in service to humanity when God's life is activated within our consciousness. We have accepted the lie all of our lives that we are something less than what God is. How could we be anything less than God if he planted his very own life in this earthen vessel? We have believed all of our lives that we are human and were born with a corrupt nature and sold in sin when the exact opposite is true. More on this later. How could something God planted become corrupted? We were made in his image, with his mind and creative ability. So however we perceive things to be, they will be for us. As a man thinks so is he. We have perceived ourselves wrong all of our life but that is about to change. God is bringing us light and revelation through his word and by his spirit. The apostle Paul says how we grown to be clothed with our heavenly body from on high. The way we perceive our body is what must disappear. Because this body is a glorious body all the time we thought that we had to die to get it. Yet if the carnal man we perceive ourselves as dissolves in our consciousness, we will become the manifested sons the world is groaning for. Who told you? You were a sinner. Paul told the Ephesians, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. F530 you are bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh. How could your body be sinful? Only if you perceive it to be so. God has never told you, you were a sinner. Man has told you that. God has never told you that. 2000 years ago, the message of Calvary is, sin came to an end. 2000 years ago, the world was judged at Calvary. Very few Christians understand Calvary today. The scriptures tell you all about it. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The real sin is your mistaken identity, which is really what causes you to believe its lies. Your mistaken identity perceives it itself as something other than what God is. The scriptures tell us that the iniquity of us all was laid on him. The scriptures tell us that Jesus paid the penalty for every act of disobedience and every transgression. The scriptures are true and cannot be broken so why do we fear that someday we are still going to be judged for our sin? We count the cross of Christ as none effect whenever we put ourselves under guilt and condemnation. Because Jesus says, the cross says, God, in his son said, not guilty you see, it's not your fault that you have perceived yourself wrong all of your life. Because it's what you've been taught, and whatever you believe will be your experience. And once we know the truth we can repent, change our mind about who we are, and we then will begin to perceive ourselves as we are, a son or daughter of God, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and all things are created by the word, and you being in his image, your words are the most powerful things in the universe, and so if you perceive yourself to be a certain way, and then you speak like that, it solidifies that perception you have of yourself that is wrong, because whatever you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth will be that which you experience in your daily life, it can be no other way, it doesn't mean it is truth, 
It means you have accepted a lie that said, you are other than what God is. There is only one life in the whole universe, only one life, and that is the life of God. And that life is omnipresent, meaning that there is nowhere that God does not exist. That's what omnipresent means. If there is any place in this whole universe that God doesn't exist, then he's not omnipresent. Yet the religious man will stand behind the pulpit and tell the sinner that God has no part in him, that he's alienated and separated from God, and surely God is not in him. If that is so, then God is not omnipresent. We limit God by our perceptions. The light of God, the spirit of God, the candle of the Lord, is in every man. And man means mankind. Not just male, but man means mankind in the Bible. So he was that true light that lights every man that comes into the world. When you realize that you are God on this earth, and that God has sent you here for a purpose, that is to impart his life in all of creation, you will stop waiting for something to happen. We have a whole generation of people waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Yet if we begin to perceive ourselves as we are, instead of how we have thought we were, you will see the greatest manifestation of God ever known to man. It's not something that's going to fall out of the sky. It's not something that God is going to process you into through sickness and disease, and trials and tribulations. Although that's all there, we may always be having trials and tribulations. But when we begin to perceive ourselves as God created us to be our experience will drastically change. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. 1 Peter 1 23 24 For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not wrong. 7 18 Paul was not talking about the body here. He was talking about this mind that is alienated and an enemy to God. I know that in my natural human understanding, an identity that is separated and alienated from God. In that image of myself there is no good thing. There is only the knowledge of good and evil that continually keeps me in this merry-go-round of trying to choose the good over the evil. It always keeps me alienated and separated in my mind from who I really am. We must stop taking the message of Christianity that we are born sinners and are separated from God. We must learn to listen to what God is speaking to our heart about these things. Do not take the word of men over and against what God is saying to you in your heart. If what I'm saying to you today does not make any sense, does not bear any witness to you, you need to put it on the shelf. But if it does, if you can see what I'm saying today, don't let any man rob you of it. Because many will come and say, this is a new age doctrine. This is that old story about man trying to make himself as God. They will give many reasons why you better not listen to this message because you will be deceived. We know that Paul warned of that. He said, in the last days, deceivers will come teaching doctrines of devils, seducing spirits. That's where we are in the church today. We have already been deceived. We have already been deceived by all the teachings of how we are separated from God, and we're sinners, and we're under condemnation, and all of that was the lying, seducing things that came into the original church after the apostles passed the scene. Some began to teach people that they were separate from God. How do you think that Paul and Peter, and those men, did what they did? Because Jesus had been with them and taught them the things pertaining to the kingdom. He taught them that they were one with God and if they could believe nothing would be impossible to them. He taught them they were not people of a human decent. What do you think Jesus meant when he said, Call no man your father, if I call an earthly man. Father, that means I relate my beginnings with the Father who naturally gave me life. Jesus said, don't ever call an earthly man. Father, you have one Father, the creator of all things who brought you into existence. That is your Father, you. In that uncreated, indestructible life of God were in existence before you became a physical being. That's why we recognize that God is our Father. You know, scriptures call him, the Father of spirits. You see, God has nothing to do with your human existence as far as how you perceive yourself with your natural mind and understanding. God has nothing to do with that. God has only one thing on this earth that he is cultivating. He is watering, he is nourishing, and that is his seed in this earth this body temple, and he's stirring us, he regenerating us, he's opening our eyes to see where we have accepted the life for 2000 years that we are other than what he is, and thank god today the veils are being removed, next chapter, TV incorruptible seed part 2, we have been taught so many things that we have accepted as truth, that has hindered the awareness of our true nature and identity, I want to say again that every seed must produce after its own kind, the seed when it produces, and what it produces, is not anything different than what it is, in other words, again using the illustration of a melon, the melon seed you could say is a three part being, it starts out as a seed, it has the meat of the melon, and it has the rind, but it's still one, the seed is the melon, the meat is the melon and the rind is the melon, the seed of God in us does not reproduce anything but an incorruptible being, it does not produce a fallen soul and a corrupted body, we have believed and been taught for years that we are corruptible, this is why the apostle Paul told us this corruptible must put on incorruption, we do that through revelation and changing the perception of ourselves from a corruptible being to an incorruptible being. The mentality of being a corruptible being is the seed of the serpent. Because the serpent sowed that thought or that seed in God's field that caused us to believe we are something other than what God made us to be. The darkened, alienated, carnal mind is the tear. And God said, let them grow together until the harvest, and the tear will be pulled and burned. Well guess what? It is harvest time. And the tear, our human consciousness is, if it is not now, it shortly shall be, in the fire that will consume everything in our consciousness that is not according to God. The seed of our true nature will not be consumed because that seed is an incorruptible, indestructible seed. I want to look at Colossians chapter 1 again. We read in verse 21, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled.
reconciled. I don't think that we can emphasize the point enough. Actually, in reality, you have never been alienated from God. You were taught you were, so you believed you were, which gave you a wrong perception of yourself so that became your experience. You see, again, that is the seed of the serpent, the consciousness that makes you feel that you are separated and alienated from God, but that is only in your mind. That is the veil that was cast over all nations to keep them from the reality of Christ in them. You were sometimes alienated in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy, unblamable and unreprovable in his sight. Calvary says that you are not a sinner separated from God. Calvary says that there is no such thing any longer as anyone who is separated and alienated from God. Calvary says that there is only one man in the universe. There's only one life in the universe, and that is God's life. There is no other life. You perceive another life, but there is no other life. Paul says, the mystery which has been ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. I do believe that when Paul wrote this that he had the reality of what he spoke, but just like Eve in the garden, she was a type of the church. The church is a picture of Eve, a picture of the bride of Christ, and just as Eve was the deceived in the garden, so the church of Christ was deceived again after the apostles left the scene. In fact, even before the apostles left, you can see that Paul says all in Asia had turned away from him, and so as Eve was deceived in the beginning, the church, the New Testament church was once again deceived by the serpent, with the same lie, and they became darkened in their understanding, and that's why Paul told the Ephesians in chapter Chapter 4, this I say therefore, that you walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God which is in them here again we can see, it was only in the mind, if we walk in the natural mind thinking that we are separate from God and less than a son of God, then we do not understand the magnitude of Calvary's victory, we then are alienated in our mind from the life and nature of God and that is in us, this is why Paul said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, Phil 2, 5 he also said, you have the mind of Christ, how do we let that mind be in us, ah, it is through practice, it is learning how to discern that which is of God, from that which is from the natural mind, and I believe this is the only warfare, really, in this day and age that we need to be concerned about, and that is the warfare Paul talks about when he said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are not according to human reasonings, but, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and those strongholds are not devils in the airwaves, you see, many of us fought devils in the airwaves for years, but he said, casting down the strongholds, casting down reasonings, imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of the word of God, so how you begin to walk in this mind of Christ is to begin to cast down every thought that would try to enter your mind that speaks contrary to the truth the word of the living God. You see, Calvary says, there is no such thing any longer as a carnal human being. Calvary says, there is no longer any such thing as a carnal mind. Yet because of our perception, we see carnality, sin and death and all of these things. We see them around us. Well, that's a lie. The truth is, my old identity, my old carnality, everything that I believe that I was in the natural was crucified at Calvary. You see, there is no such individual personality by the name of Gary Sigler. Gary Sigler is a manifestation of God on the earth. Not as an individual, but as a cell in the body of Christ. We are members one of another. You know, the most fabulous thing I think is science and technology in these days. And one of the things we've learned to think about is cloning. And if you know anything at all about cloning, you know that you can take one cell, just one cell from your body, and that one cell through cloning will reproduce you. Just that one cell. Think about that. One cell of your being through cloning will reproduce another human. Well, God has been in the cloning business for centuries. You see, it's not that we're this big individual. God on the earth. No, no, no. But we are a cell. We are a member of his body. And corporately, we make up the whole. And that's why it is so important that we connect a network amongst ourselves in fellowship, and in sharing and in worship and in testimony. There is only one life that exists in this universe. Only one. There aren't two. If there is, then Calvary didn't work. And again, I know how hard these things are to deal with. Because you say, but look at the situation. Look at the carnality. Look at the sin. Look at all of this. Yet the living abiding spoken word of God says that. That old thing was crucified at Calvary. If you'll remember, I don't know exactly where it's at now, but you'll remember this instance. It talks about about revelation about the beast that was wounded unto death, and yet he lives, he was resurrected, well beast in the scriptures refers to the human nature, to humanity, the carnal human being, on the cross, that being was put to death, he was wounded unto death, yet he lives because of our perceptions, we keep the image of ourselves alive through our thoughts, our speaking and our meditations, and it is really not that difficult to totally have a mind change, and that's what the word, repent means, and that is to change your mind, repent, change your mind, for the kingdom of heaven is come, isn't it strange that Jesus stood facing the Pharisees before he went into death, before he resurrected, and he looked at them and he told them, the kingdom of heaven is within you, because of the misconceptions, we have never really learned how to apply that which we know to be the truth, because we tend to believe that which we experience, according to the carnal mind, Jesus answered Nicodemus, saying, verily I say unto you except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, Peter said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, 1 Peter 1 23 no man will see the kingdom without this new birth, well what is this new birth, this new birth is your quickening, is the regeneration, is that spark of life that you receive when you first experience in reality, God in you, know no man after the flesh after Calvary it is said, henceforth, we should know no man according to the flesh 2 Cor 5 16, we should know no man according to our human understanding and comprehension, even Jesus, we once knew Jesus according to the flesh, the human carnal understanding as the man of Galilee, but today we should not know him according to the flesh, almost all of Christianity still sees Jesus according to the flesh, and they still worship him according to the flesh, on Christmas they put him in manger, and on Easter they put him on a cross and resurrected him, and the next year they put him back in a manger, we worship him according to the flesh rather than according to spirit, because when you begin to see the Lord as he is today you will be like him because to see him as he is, is to be like him, 
He is the head. We are the body. The body of Christ is not less divine than the head. He came to give us the example, or to show us the way that we could be as he is. In fact that's what the scriptures say, as he is so are we in this world. 1 John 4 17. Well, do you think he's sick? Do you think he's any type of failure? You see, there has been so much philosophy and human reasoning brought in amongst us that we accept the lie because the truth seems so impossible for us to grasp. We have been taught, some of us, that sickness is a blessing from God to possibly teach you something. But I'll tell you what, the seed is incorruptible, the fruit is incorruptible, the incorruptible seed within me cannot produce a body that is corruptible. But again, because we are a manifestation of God on the earth, and we are as he is, we will become that which we perceive we are in our thinking. If you believe that Jesus puts a cancer or any other type of disease on you to teach you something, if you really believe that, you wouldn't try to get rid of it. You know, it's like the teaching of hell that so many of us used to believe in. This place called eternal torment. Yet we believed it intellectually, but we never really believed it. Because if we really did, and it really gripped us, you couldn't rest knowing that perhaps some of your family died without Christ. Except a man be born again the moment that spark of his life is ignited in you through regeneration however you receive that. Some come to an altar. Personally, I knelt down in my bathroom alone one day and asked Jesus to become real to me. I asked him if possible, to come into my life and change me. It doesn't matter how you experience that. Some have experiences out in the woods. Some have experienced it out of desperation. The most important thing is that you have that experience of that quickening, that regeneration by the spirit and become a new creation man. All old things are passed away. But see, we are so used to looking at our condition. We believe the scriptures but our experience is more real to us than what God has said. So we live in this darkened state. We're living that condition that Paul told us not to in the vanity of the mind. Again he said, don't be like the other Gentiles, being alienated and separated in your mind with a darkened understanding. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, but as many as have received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Once the spirit of God regenerates your spirit, if you were not caught up into the religious teachings, you would learn to follow the anointing within you. You would from that very moment in your life learn to trust the anointing of the spirit within you to teach you all things. The spirit would never deceive you. If you were taught that, and you stayed away from religious things, you would very quickly begin to manifest as a son or daughter of God on this earth. It is our religious teachings that have kept us in bondage to carnality. I don't know about you, but I was never told that Jesus did not hold me accountable for my sins. In fact, I was told the opposite. One preacher told me, he said, Gary, you don't work your way to the cross, but you better work your way away from it. In other words, saved by grace, but then I have to work and I have to be obedient and I have to do all of these things or I may eventually be lost. But you see, if we were taught in the very beginning the truth of this new creation man that springs to life on the inside of us, and we were taught only to do what we feel in our hearts to do as we love and fellowship with the Lord, we would not get caught up in all the religious practices. However, we are taught Old Testament law instead of grace. We are taught, well, yes Gary, you are born again. But look at what you are doing. And don't you know that the scriptures say that your heart is deceitfully wicked? Well, I understand that is what the Old Testament says. But I realized one day that that was a lie for me. Because the new covenant is, I will take your stony heart out of you and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. S36, 26, 27. Where is man involved in that statement of scripture? Where is our choice involved here? Sin has been dealt with. We weren't taught that sin was fully dealt with at the cross. We were not taught to not look at the sin. But look to the gospel. We were not taught that God does not hold you accountable for sin. One of my favorite scriptures is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not holding them accountable for their sins. 2 Cor 5:19. Why? He sees Christ in you, not Adam. Christ is that indestructible seed of God that you are. I love the song that says, I am no longer in Adam, and Adam is no longer in me. I love that because it is the truth. As long as you perceive yourself as an Adam, and a sinner, one who is not pleasing God, and you focus on your weaknesses and your failures, you will always be in bondage to that image of yourself. Oh God, how we need our eyes open to the truth of our being. It would be good to pray the prayer in Ephesians, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened that we might know the hope of our calling. How could we be failures? I tell you, all of us that are weak and sickly among us are there because we have not rightly discerned his body, because it's impossible for his body to be sick. It's impossible for his body to be anything but perfect. It's impossible for that incorruptible seed to reproduce anything that can even in the slightest, remotest way able to be corrupted. We have been seduced just as Eve in the garden, and we have believed a lie instead of the truth. F5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, following Christ within I really, really have to cover this with scripture because I know so many are saying to their own hurt that what is being taught here is new age. I long for the day when we can speak the words of God and not have to back it up with scripture. Not that there is anything wrong with that. How do you think Paul convinced his followers? He didn't have the New Testament to go to, and that's why they killed Jesus. He literally went against their written word. In fact, he tried to correct some of their perceptions of God when he said to them, I know what is written in your very own scriptures. I know what is written, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, you love your enemies. Basically, what he was telling them is, you have had a wrong concept woven in your scriptures. That's not my father. Well, we have the same situation today. We have to tell people, listen, I know what is written in your Bible. But you see, that's why it is so important for everyone to become acquainted with the Christ within. Because it's impossible for that anointing to lie to you. John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 16, 13, howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall
shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. Do you know why most Christians do not know all things today? They run to men for their instruction instead of learning to follow the Christ within. They run to the arm of flesh to get their answers. That's the truth. There came a day in my life when I had to stop seeking the truth from a man, and I had to spend a long time just seeking God for my answers. It took me quite some time to where I could trust my anointing. It took a long time where I could be convinced that what I was hearing and what I was seeing was God, because it went against everything that I ever believed and was taught. I knew I was a failure. I knew that I was hung up in lust and all the sins of the flesh, and I wanted God. But yet, when I began to hear God, I had to question whether or not it was God because it went against everything that I was taught. Who is in the body of Christ? Ephesians 5.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Well, are we still waiting for that? I'll tell you what, it happened at Calvary. Another thing about not rightly discerning the body of Christ, I realized one day that it wasn't just the Christians, it wasn't just the man who ran to an altar, or said Jesus I receive you, because of Calvary it includes all. If you are walking in a human body, you are a member of the body of Christ only because of Calvary. Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 2, wherefore remember, that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, in the Jewish mind, the Gentile was the unbeliever, the unsaved, the dog, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one. Who is he talking about, the Jew and the Gentile, the saved and the lost? I'll tell you folks, when you begin to rightly discern the body and not divide, but discern the body of Christ, you will begin to treat all humanity as they really are, and you will change them by your perception of them. He has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two, the Jew, the Gentile, the saved, the lost, one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. That's why I can tell you in full assurance of faith. You are not Adam, and Adam is not in you. By the cross, every negative thing in the universe was brought to an end, and by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from among the dead, the new creation man was brought into being. There is no more old creation, but it is still living in our perception because we look, not with spiritual eyes, but with eyes of the flesh. Oh, we love God, we want God, but we know it's humanly impossible to be as he is. But, we are not human beings, we are spiritual beings. Yes, thank God, the veils are being removed from our eyes to see that nothing can corrupt the seed of God within us. Nothing. It is incorruptible and it is indestructible. Your body is the temple of God, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James 4, 8. What is a double-minded man? What double-minded means is, to salve, as long as in your perception, you believe that you are a separate entity from God, and you have a soul that has fallen and that soul is doing everything in its power to become like God you are double-minded. That is the man in Romans chapter 7 who has this desire for God, yet he sees in his fleshy carnal members that sin principle is still pulling him down into the law of sin and death. That's the perception that has to change. There has never been sinner born since Calvary. We only keep sin alive by our perceptions. We have to have a revelation from God. I'll never forget the day I awoke the 11th of July, 1982. I woke up a new man after years of struggle, and I began to understand some of these things. I John chapter 2 and verse 8. A new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shines. He that says he is in the light, and hath of his brother, is in darkness even until now. I know the religious mind will interpret this verse. You don't treat another believer bad. Well, I'll tell you what. God is the father of all of us, and we are all connected in spirit to one another. The darkness is past and the true light now shines. You know Jesus told his disciples 2,000 years ago, you are the light of the world, and some of them caught what he said. The scriptures tell us God is light. So really he was telling his disciples, you are God in this earth. Yet where are the people today who can boldly declare, we are the light of this world? Well, there are some. We are coming into this revelation of being Christ on the earth. It is only through this awareness that all of creation will be restored and brought back to God. Because as we continually have these veils removed from our eyes collectively, it will change the whole world. I Corinthians 15:52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Listen folks, the dead people are not those people out there in the graves. Jesus clearly taught, and the scriptures plainly teach us that dead people are those who do not know God in reality. But at the last trump, and that last trump could come for you at any moment. Now we've always looked at this as a collective experience, and it may be someday. But that last trump for you is when you hear the word of incorruptibility, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Your unrenewed mind is a real barrier to understanding this truth. This corruptible, this mindset, this awareness of being separate and alienated from God, this is what we consider as mortality. But this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And we don't do that through the Adamic mind. We do that by hearing the word, the voice of the seventh angel. Revelation 10, 7. It says, when the voice of the seventh angel is heard, all the mystery of God shall be fulfilled. Well, what is the mystery of God? But God manifesting himself in the flesh. When you begin to hear that seventh angel sound, you will begin to arise in a moment. In a twinkling of an eye and you will totally be changed. And what changes is your perception. You were caught up with him in the air, in heavenly places where no longer will you rule from the earthly plane. You will rule from the heavenly plane. You will begin to walk in the experience of being seated in heavenly places, and operating from the realm of the heavens rather than from the realm of the earth. You will no longer see yourself as a mortal human being. You will see yourself as a spiritual being. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death. 
is the concept that you are something other than what God has made you to be, will be swallowed up and be no more. O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. You want to get people into bondage? Start teaching them law. Start teaching them how that if they are not obedient, they can't please God, and watch the condemnation and the guilt and the shame come. God is raising up a people on the earth today, after the Melchizedek order, and we all know about Melchizedek, without beginning of days, or end of life. You know that's who you are when you have a revelation of the incorruptible seed that you are. That's why you can call no earthly man your father 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 and 10. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, and has brought life and incorruptibility to light through the gospel. But God spoke it to reveal to you the incorruptibility that you are. When you realize you are a spiritual being you cannot be corrupted, but if you believe you can, you'll experience it only until the light of God penetrates the darkened mind and explodes throughout your being. Then you will realize you are not a mortal human being. Well, we need to look at Psalm 82. But God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will he judge unjustly, and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do just to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Why will you die like men? Because you do not know who you are. The word gods here is the word Elohim. And when it says that God, Elohim, stands in the congregation of the mighty and judges among the gods, the same word is Elohim. So Elohim stands in the congregation of the mighty and he judges among the Elohim. How long will it be before we deliver the poor and the needy, those who walk in darkness? Well, we can't do it as long as we are walking in that darkness with them. The same word Elohim is used in Genesis chapter 1 when it says, Let us make man in our image. We have been in so much darkness. Take it not lightly to be in tune with God. That is your heritage. I have said, you are gods, but you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes, because you believe you will, because you are walking in darkness. We've had the scriptures for 2,000 years, and rather than learn how to follow that anointing that is within us, we've run to the arm of flesh for our instruction, and they have only kept us in darkness and bondage to keep us under their control. Thank God that is coming to an end. John chapter 10 and verse 33, the Jews answered Jesus saying, for a good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, and because that you, being a man, makes yourself God. Jesus answered them saying, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods, if he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sent into the world, thou blasphemest. Because I said I am the Son of God, I think the scriptures are so clear that they can just grab a hold of us and stop this mind that is always speaking contrary to what we know the truth is. Ephesians 5 says in verse 30, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. Well, is that true? If it is true, how can this body be sick? How can this body be diseased? I'm talking to myself here as well as anybody else. But you see, it is time that we awake out of sleep. Arise and shine, for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And I'll tell you, nations shall come to the rising of God within you, within his people in these days. No longer do we have to go out and get them. God, they come to you, when you have the living, abiding word of God that will change people's lives. They will run to you, when you won't gather them unto yourself. You'll simply teach them that which they have within them. I think a Christian maybe needs to go to a class of few weeks to get a clear understanding of that incorruptible seed, a clear understanding that they have an anointing. They don't need another man, ever again, to teach them, just a few weeks, and leave them alone. And then we come together in fellowship. We really don't need a man to stand up here and teach us, because we have the teacher inside of us. We have the anointing within us. And when we come together, there will be such a flow of his life. Any who come in among us would be healed. Any who come in among us walking in the dark and understanding of their mind would receive the light of God. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Don't you know that? Well, I have known that for years. But today I'm beginning to really understand. Learning how to cast down everything that would point the finger and say, Look at you. How dare you say that your body couldn't be sick? Look at you, I can laugh. I'm just reminded of Abraham. Whenever the accusations would come into my mind, I'd simply remember Abraham who considered not his own body as question mark and dead. Ah, but he considered him faithful who had promised. You see, if we look in this direction for results, I don't believe it will ever happen. We don't look to the flesh. We can't grasp this with our human understanding, but we are members of Christ. That means if you touch someone, Christ is touching them. Ephesians 1 says in verse 22, he has put all things under his feet, meaning Jesus, and has appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church, a headship exercised throughout the world church. This is the amplified version. So let's start over. This is amplified, and has put all things under his feet, and has appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church, a headship exercised throughout the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. For in that body lies the full measure of him who makes everything complete, and who fill everything everywhere with himself. That's the truth. Yet we believed a lie, just as easily the lie of the serpent. And do you not know that Jesus had to go through the same lie? I think religion has even painted an unclear picture of Jesus. We have the crazy notion that he was so perfect that it was impossible for him to sin. I don't think so. Otherwise he could not have been tempted in all points. Someone said, well if you are who you claim you are, let's see you walk through that wall and let's see you raise the dead. What did Jesus say to that? If you are the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. If he did it, it would only prove that he missed the mark. He was tempted in all points. And the only reason that he did not fail, if he had a clear, precise understanding that he was the son of God. And when you and I have a clear precise understanding that we are what the word says we are then not only will we be as he is we will act out of an experiential walk of being christ on the earth 
In this body lies the full measure of him who makes everything complete. This is the word of God and who fills everything. Everywhere with himself. Some things. No. All things. Paul must have been a lonely man in his day. To have this revelation. And he could stand before a congregation of people and say. Don't you know folks. You are complete in him. You don't need anything else. You don't need to change anything about yourself. You are complete. In him. You are complete. You just need to repent. To change your mind about who you think that you are. Because who you think you are doesn't exist in reality. You know. The Christian science people have been mocked for years because they say things like. Well. There's no sin. There is no sickness. There is no disease. But folks, I tell you what, until you believe that, until you have an understanding of that, that's what Calvary was all about. My old man, that old concept of being a human being, alienated, being separated, being a sinner, living a life of sin, that whole mess went to the cross. God became a man, and he took that man, representing all of the misconceptions. He took that man into death, and that's why he came. Oh yes, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up I will draw all men unto me. Now another thing about Jesus, he used the word me in places but he never took any credit from his human existence. In other words he said, I am my own self, I can't do anything. Now stop and think about this. Here was a man who was the perfect man, without sin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. This man said, I can't do anything of myself. What makes us think we can? You see, religion will teach us to try. The word and faith preachers would teach you to go out and heal the sick and raise the dead. And you do it by just praying for everybody. And occasionally you might hit it. God, right today, fills everything, everywhere with himself. Oh, if you could see that. At Calvary, you can never hear this enough until you can see it plainly, and boldly declare it. Sin is no more. God does not hold man accountable for his sin, because he realizes he is living in a mistaken identity that is not even real. His concept of himself, her perception of himself is what he receives from Adam. And once you have awakened, once you are regenerated, that old is no more. He never was, but you come to realize it through regeneration. In Colossians 3 and verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. Boy, that's a good one. Renewed in knowledge. You know Jesus said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yet it goes on to say the reason they were destroyed for lack of knowledge is because they rejected knowledge. You can hear the living word of God spoken from the mouth of his servants today and reject that word, and be destroyed for lack of knowledge. Not because you haven't heard it, but because you've rejected it. We need to be renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Oh boy, that's good. We have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This is the knowledge that we must put on. This is the incorruptibility that we must put on. This is the immortality that we must put on. The renewed knowledge has been created in the image of God, and we have never lost that standing with God, except we have become alienated and separated in our minds. And that's why Paul said, you must be renewed in the spirit of your mind, because until your mind is renewed, you will always think you are something other than what God is. And when your mind begins to be renewed, it is so easy for you then to believe what God has spoken to you. When the anointing within you begins to operate, and you begin to hear and follow that which is in your heart, you will be free from all control. You know, the people who are really free today, are those who have weathered the church, because to them, freedom is rebellion. Yet a free man, a spiritual free man, is one who is in bondage to no man, will be controlled by no man, will not go to the arm of flesh for his answers, but he knows that the anointing abides within him, and will teach him all things, and will bring to remembrance all things. We don't have a clue what we've forgotten. Elohim in the very beginning, and put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. We are neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, or question mark bound nor free, but Christ. Listen to this. Christ is all and in all, not Christ will someday be all and in all, but right today we have put on that new man that is created in the image of him who realizes that there is neither Jew nor Greek nor sinner nor saved nor lost nor male nor female nor bond nor free, but is all and in all, and we have the privilege of going to people and speaking life to them instead of death, freedom instead of bondage, hope instead of despair, because we see Christ in all men, our perceptions are changing, and no longer do we see male nor female, bond nor free, sinners and saints, we see Christ is all and in all, Amen. The Incorruptible Seed Part 3. The last Adam the perception of our outward man is perishing as we realize the truth of our being. The revelation of atonement makes us realize that the perception we have of our old man, carnal nature, was crucified at Calvary, and our inward man, our spiritual man, is being renewed day by day. We have known that we have the incorruptible seed within us, but I don't think that we have fully realized that we are that incorruptible seed. It is not something we have, it is something that we are. I would like to ask you the question again. Who told you that you were a sinner? I can guarantee you that you have never heard God speak in your spirit and tell you that you were a sinner. We have only received and accepted that information because it has come from our religious teachers and leaders. If there ever was such a thing as a sinner being born, it was not possible after the cross. In fact, it is impossible. The only assurance we have that we are walking correctly and have a correct understanding of spiritual things is that we have to be able to discern for ourselves that which is of God, and that which is not. Jesus the Christ proves to us through the magnitude of Calvary's victory that our sinful nature does not exist in reality. We are a new creation in Christ and are his sons on this earth. We may feel like sinners and be under condemnation because of living under the law of sin and death, but it is a lie. It may be very real to us, but only the truth of our being will set us free from the law of sin and death. The scriptures reveal to us that the gospel is a mystery. In Revelation it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Rev 10, 7. When you begin to hear the voice of the seventh angel then the mystery of God in you begins to come into fullness. The mystery of God is fulfilled when you realize the kernel of that mystery is God manifested in the flesh, and not just in a man, but in all men. The mystery of God will be complete when every man is a manifestation of God in the flesh. When I use the word man I use it the way the scriptures use it. Man means mankind. It does not mean male. When all of mankind reveals, expresses, and walks, as God on this earth, 
the mystery of God will be fulfilled. When I say walk as God, I do not mean some egotistical puffed up intellectual knowledge. I mean that we will walk in love. God is love. To walk in resentment, bitterness, hatred and divisiveness is to experience the ego in the fullest sense of the word. Walking in love does not mean walking with no discernment. It does not mean we cannot rightly divide the truth. It does not mean that there is no severity in God. Everything that God does, he does because he loves us. His correction is to bring change in our perception of ourselves and others. It seems as though everything in this so-called physical world that we see that is temporal is against this manifestation of God in the flesh. You see, no matter how religious you are, no matter how much you love God, no matter how many times you go to church, you might fast, you might pray, you might do all of these things. Yet there is something in this carnal mind that will not even suggest to you that you are God on this earth. It is that serpentine lie that keeps you in this state of perceiving yourself as something other than what God is. That was the lie in the beginning and it is the same today. You see the lie is that you are less than what God is so you feel the need to change or add something to yourself that will make you more like God. The reality is you are like God. You are his son. And as his son you cannot be anything less except in the wrong perception of yourself that you are a separate individual. This is what is known as the ego, or self-life. The personal sense of ego is what causes all the negative forces in our lives. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was the firstborn among many brothers. Rom 8 29. We are just as much a son of God as Jesus is. We have the same life, same nature, same abilities that Jesus has. As he is so are we in this world. So who told you that you were a sinner? In I Corinthians 15 45. And so it is written. The first man Adam was made a living soul. Man was made a living soul is a very important point. He was not created a living soul but he became a living soul. The word made is the same word as became in Strong's 1096. Ginomahi. Man was created in the image of God but became a living soul. The last Adam. Christ, was made a quickening, or a life-giving, spirit. Now we all know if there is a first man, there can be a second man, a third man, a fourth man and an unlimited number of men beginning with the first man. But after the last man, there can be no other man. You see, there can be no sinners born after Christ. He took the first man into death and raised all of creation into resurrection. There is a song I love titled, I am not in Adam, and Adam is not in me. You see, Jesus the Christ, was the last Adam. After Christ there are no more Adams. There are only incarnations of God being born on the earth. I know we haven't thought of ourselves as that. In fact that is the problem. But nevertheless you and I are incarnations of God in this earth. Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. We were not born sinners. We are born as unchristed ones. Our bodies are temples of God for the expression and dominion of God in this earth. So if there cannot be any more Adams, if he was the last Adam, then who in the world are we? We cannot be anything but the incorruptible seed. Moreover, the moment that we are quickened by God, the moment we are regenerated, the moment we awaken to God, from that very moment we should never again accept the lie that we are sinners. We should never have ever been told this in the first place. We should never accept the lie that we are sinners. We have never been such a thing. Since Jesus was the last Adam, he put to death that nature, that identity, that separation of a carnal identity. Also when he resurrected he brought into being a new creation, a whole new man. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, to enter the kingdom of God you must be born again. To be born again is to have a totally new identity, and even a new concept about who you are. I don't know if I can explain this adequately or not, and some of you may know this, but you are affected by the mass consciousness of this world. People say, if we're not sinners, why do we experience this separation from God? It is because everyone in this universe expects you to act a certain way. Furthermore, it also has to do with the tear, the seed of the serpent that is sown in you at the time of your birth. Now what is the seed of the serpent? The seed of the serpent is the human identity, which is the ego, and what we've always been told is the human nature. It is the parable of the sower that sowed in the Field, the wheat. In addition as the wheat was sown it says the enemy came and sowed the tear. Well, the wheat is the Christ nature, the seed of God, and the tear is that false identity, that false concept of yourself that says you are alienated and separated from God. The carnal religious mind will tell you that although you are saved you must clean up the human nature. When we realize the truth of the magnitude of Calvary's victory, that human nature will not be there to bother us any longer. The scriptures clearly teach us about Calvary, and Christ being the last Adam. It is absolutely impossible for sinners to be born in this world. So who are we? We are the seed of God on this earth. You see, we bought the lie about being born separated and alienated from God. Peter tells us that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the living, abiding word of God. So that seed that you are is an incorruptible seed. The incorruptible seed cannot reproduce anything in you other than Christ. Anything in you that you perceive is not Christ is temporal and subject to change when you learn to put on the mind of Christ. You might say, well Gary, are you saying that we don't need redemption anymore? Are you throwing out the cross? Absolutely not. The cross is the centrality of this message. It is because of the cross and redemption that we are one with God. You have to understand that your redemption took place 2000 years ago. You were forgiven and made a new creation before you were born. However, as long as you feel separated as well as being alienated in your mind, and you still feel like something other than what God is, you will never come into the fullness of what has been provided for you in the atonement. The cross of Calvary and the resurrection of Jesus are the most important events in history. Your Christian experience will never be full until you have a complete revelation of what happened at Calvary and the resurrection. The whole world has been redeemed and belongs to God. What we need is to be awakened to this reality. Some of God's people are fighting against this concept of us awakening to our true nature and identity. But you know the Apostle Paul said, Awake you who are sleeping, arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine on you. Ephesians 5.14 If you are not walking in the realization of being a son of God on the earth, 
Then you are sleeping and you need to wake up. When you awake, you awaken his likeness. I'll never forget on the 11th of July, 1982. Not that many years ago, I awoke with the realization of many of the things that I'm sharing today. I had sought God and studied for years and God had been leading me to this realization that I am his son now not someday. Things that had been bothering me for years. Habits and lusts. When I awoke in his likeness, those things fell at my feet. Many of you have heard me share how that for 13 years as a Christian I was horribly addicted to nicotine. Moreover there was no way that I could break it. I used to tell God all the time. When you come you see I wasn't expecting at that time Jesus to appear within me. I was expecting him to only come in the heavens. I would say to him many times in tears, I know that when you come, I'll probably fall in shame before your coming because there is no way that I can give up this nicotine. I can't do it. But on the 11th of July, 1982, I awoke, and after years of struggling, with tears, with begging, with pleading, with fasting and crying, I awoke in his likeness. Never again did I have the desire not only for nicotine, but for all of those other lustful things that had me in captivity. God had been revealing to me for years his unconditional love and acceptance and that is when I began to walk in some of the reality of being a son of God. I began to realize the value of Calvary. Also God began to reveal to me how he looks at us, that Christ was the last Adam. There are no longer two kinds of life in reality born on this earth. There are only incarnations of God coming to this earth. I know how that sounds to those minds that are conditioned by all the teachings about how we are sinners and separate from God. The only things that are real are spiritual things. That's why Paul says that we look not at the temporal things, the things that are subject to change. Because if we look at ourselves as a sinful creature, we miss one of the most important revelations. Even though we are born again, many of us have this concept of ourselves as not being good enough, not being acceptable enough. And as long as you have that concept of yourself, it traps you in this alienation by separation in your mind. But if you have the revelation that the scriptures give to you about being a son of God, the incorruptible seed and you can only reproduce a soul that is in the image of God. So when the seed of God is quickened in you, then the only thing that seed of God can do from that point is reproduce everything in that seed, in your soul. But as long as you continue to buy the lie that we are not like God, that we can never be God. And when I say, be God, I'm not talking about being the creator of the universe. I'm simply talking about a life. We have believed for years that we have a human life. And nobody gets upset when you say you are a human. But when you say you are God, people get upset because they don't understand that if you are not God, then you are just human. But you are God in the sense that you have his life, his nature, his ability, his compassion, everything that God is, you are. You are as Jesus is, a God-man. You are as Jesus is a divine human. And it's not something you have to become. It's something that you already are. The very moment we begin to try to become that which God has already made us to be, we are telling God, we don't believe your word. I know you said to us that at the cross all of our sins were paid for, that we were raised a brand new creation. But God I want you to make me a better person. We keep pleading and begging for God to change us, when really what we need to be praying for is light and revelation that we might see that which we already are. Because you can't become it. The moment you are trying to become that which God has made you to be, you are in the wrong mindset. Because you are in the mind that is separated and alienated from God. You are trying to make that thing acceptable to God. And again, that keeps you alienated and separated from God. But with a little light and revelation from God on the whole magnitude of Calvary's victory, you will understand that it is impossible for you to be alienated and separated from God. Except by receiving the lie in your mind that would tell you that you are something other than what God is. This is putting on the mind of Christ. Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven, and you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblammable and unreprovable in his sight, that is how you are born, yet we are told, also expected by almost all of creation, that we are born in sin, and are expected to be sinners, because we have never been told the truth, we've accepted the lie, thank God the lie is being exposed, to present you holy and unblammable and unreprovable in his sight is a present reality, not a future event, there is no one in heaven or in earth that can bring any guilt or condemnation to you, once you realize the magnitude of Calvary's victory, and understand that this human life that you've been living all of your life is not the real you, but you are the incorruptible, indestructible seed of God on the earth. The more we have the realization of that, the more our inner man is strengthened day by day. This outward man, this man, that is lost in a consciousness that is full of defeat, failure, hang-ups and alienated from God, will fall at our feet without any effort on our part at all. The spiritual life was never meant to be a struggle as it has been for most of us all of our lives. You see, people who view themselves only as a human being find it almost impossible to walk in the God kind of life, because we believe ourselves to be that person that is separate from God. No matter how much we love God, if we are not willing to accept all that he has provided and what he has said to us, if we are not willing to turn away from that which we feel is real unto that which we know is real, we cannot accept experience these things. The mind that perceives itself as something other than what God is will not let us experience these things. I know many have been Christians for years who love God, go to church, and do many good things, yet they do not realize that they still have a natural mind. That is what is killing us. One who learns to put on and live from the mind of Christ is one who recognizes and walks in the reality of the new covenant. Everyone today has the mind of Christ within them. Everyone can learn and I use the word learn for lack of a better word. It is by practice and application that we can begin to walk in the reality of the mind of Christ, which we have. But we cannot practice the application as long as we still allow the thoughts to enter our mind to tell us the lie that we are separated from God, having made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things to himself. This message of God's unconditional love and acceptance changes people. We had an instance where someone in a mental institution was given one of our books. By reading the book, coming out of condemnation, they immediately began to recover. There are a lot of Christians in mental institutions. Why are they in such a place? Because of a lie that they are sinners separated from God. They know what they are supposed to be. 
They know what their life is supposed to be, but they cannot measure up. I suffered under depression for a long time because of not being able to measure up. I know what it is like to feel separated from God and keep trying to do better. Guilt puts men in a mental institution. Thank God I never ended up in a mental ward, but many Christians do. The Apostle Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16 The only thing that will really set us free is for us to hear the living and abiding word of God, for us to receive that word, and then just let it settle in our hearts. Meditate on it. Think about it. I'm not asking you to just receive everything that is said in this writing. Put it on the shelf if you have to, but meditate on it. Go to God with it. Once the light of God penetrates in us and out of us, we realize that we are everything spiritual that we want to be. Everything that you desire, you already are in the new creation. But we have to have the veils removed from our eyes. It is tradition that tells people they are born sinners. Yet the Bible teaches the very opposite thing without using those words. At the cross the old creation ended, and a new creation came into being. That's why Paul said, if any man is in Christ, he is a brand new creation. Old things have passed away. Well, have the old things passed away in your life? If they haven't, you've heard the gospel but you haven't heard the gospel. You've received a mixed gospel. One that tells you Christ is in you, but you still have this old nature and this old Adam to deal with. So you get into that striving and struggling to make this old image of yourself into that which you believe God is. You see, again, that's the lie of the serpent. If we really believe the scriptures and what is revealed in the new covenant, we will be set free from the lie of being in an old creation. We cannot try to make of ourselves what we already are in reality. Oh God, give us a revelation. In I Corinthians 15 47 49 it says, 47 the first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven 48 as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven 49 and just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. From New International Version in other words, you have been born into this physical world by natural parents. Furthermore you've accepted this consciousness of being a human being that is really separated from God, and unable to do that which your heart longs to do. That's the earthy man. That's the man in Romans chapter 7 that has borne the image of the earthy. He may be born again but still views himself as separate from God. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You know that is really a promise. I'll never forget when I first saw that. This verse literally says, if you have borne this image of the earthly, if you have borne this image of being an Adamic human being living in this world of separation, sin, sickness and diseases and all of the stuff that goes with it, if you have borne that image of the earthy, you shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Absolutely no conditions on that. If you have been born in the earthly image in this consciousness of sin, separation, defeat, failure, disease, heartache, and anger, resentment and bitterness. If you have borne this image of the earthly Adam, you shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, the man who knows that he is God's son on this earth. This is the man who knows that there is no longer any such thing as sin, sickness, disease and death. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to look at our body? Or are we going to be as Abraham who considered not his own body as good as dead, but believed him who promised? God promised Abraham a son, and that son came through no effort. That son came through a word of the Lord. Moreover that son would come to him in due time. But the son of the flesh Ishmael represents the Adamic man. Isaac represents the heavenly man. So Abraham in his own way, in his own carnal thinking, produced an Ishmael believing that it was what God had promised him. Abraham got so upset and said, Oh God I would that you would bless Ishmael. He wanted God to bless the work of his hands. Well God said, I'll bless Ishmael, but my promise is still to Isaac. Ishmael, the man of the earth tries by works to become an Isaac. You see, in Isaac everything comes to you by inheritance. As a son of God, as the incorruptible seed on this earth, you receive by promise, by inheritance, everything that God is, without any struggle, without any prayer, without any fasting, without all the religious jargon. Just because you are a son of God, you receive everything that he is. That is not to say we should not do those things as the Lord leads. Colossians 2.13 And you, being dead in your sins, being dead to the things of God, being dead in this Adamic human consciousness, being dead in your sin, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made alive together with him, having forgiven you of your trespasses. When did that happen 2,000 years ago? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holiday, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. 2,000 years ago, sin ended at the cross. We keep it alive because we look at that which we can see that is temporal rather than believe that which God hath spoken. Who told you, you were a sinner? Who told you, you were just a human being? I want to mention this one more time. It can never be mentioned enough. But remember the seed of God is the incorruptible seed. Every seed always produces after its own kind. It is impossible for the seed of God in you to reproduce a carnal human being. It produces in you the fine uplifted resurrected humanity of Jesus. It produces in you the indestructible life of God. You cannot plant a seed of God and reap only a carnal human being. You see, that is the lie that we've accepted. Because it seems so real to us we've believed the lie. Hypnotism is a good illustration of this Adamic person that we think we are. Most of you are probably familiar with hypnotism. Have you heard the story of the man who was brought onto the stage and hypnotized? Then told there was a white dog at his feet. So this guy went through all the actions because he saw the white dog. All of a sudden, the guy that hypnotized him said, This dog now is a mad dog and he is trying to bite you. The guy literally ran all over the stage. He panicked trying to get away from this dog that was trying to bite him on the leg. With a snap of the hypnotist's finger, the man woke from his dream and realized there was no white dog. I'm telling you folks, when you wake up, you will realize there was never any such thing as a sinner in the eyes of God. You've been hypnotized by accepting the lie of the serpent. Oh, but we are waking up. 
Who told you that you were a sinner? Ephesians 1. 3 Paul begins to tell you in Ephesians chapter 1 who you really are, and what you really have. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Is that truth? It's before the world began. It's before the disruption of the world. God chose you in him. How could you be a failure? Only if you have not really accepted, or had a revelation of these words. Now some people teach that there are only a few people that this is meant for. All of us were chosen in God before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The cross made that a reality for you. Christ was the last man Adam, and there will never be another one. You are born as Christ on the earth. If you had never been taught anything else, and you were raised expecting that as you grow in Christ, everything in you would begin to manifest that which God is, you would quickly see this whole planet redeemed from the bondage of corruption. Men's perception of themselves would be changed. But are you saying again we don't need the cross? Because it sounds like you are offering salvation without redemption. No, I'm not. You have been redeemed. You don't need to be redeemed again. You need to awake out of this stupor of sleep and hypnotism. The Apostle Paul says awake unto righteousness and sin not. It is simply a matter of knowing there is nothing we can do in ourselves. God today is speaking that living and abiding word of God that will cause your spirit to arise out of the darkness of that serpentine lion come forth a shining example of what God is on this earth. Matthew 16 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You see, as soon as you are willing to turn away and lose this personal sense of an eye, this personal ego thing, that is what has to fall into the ground and die. As long as you cling on to your earthly humanistic existence, you won't find your real life. But as soon as you find within your being the spirit of God arising, you begin then to turn away from all that which is mortal, all that which is humanistic in your thinking, all that which is failure and defeat. You begin to turn and focus everything upon that which you are the incorruptible seed of God on this earth. When that inner man begins to arise, the outer man begins to fall dead at your feet. It is not that difficult. If we were told that we need to pray for about three hours a day for a year and read ten chapters a day for five years, and by doing these things you will be just like Christ, and we really believed that, we would do it. However, it's not necessary to do anything. The work has been done. The work, it is said, was finished from the very foundations of the earth. That's Hebrews chapter 4. It says that there is a rest for the people of God. The rest is because they begin to have a realization with an understanding that the works are finished from the very foundation of the world. How else could you rest if you did not know that everything that you could possibly need is already accomplished for you? If you are constantly being concerned about your condition, about your health, about all of these things, how can you rest? But if you know that all things were finished from the foundation of the world, and you have been born as an incorruptible seed on this earth, and everything in that seed will reproduce in you everything that you need, you can rest. Whatever happens to us in the natural, if we can learn not to focus our attention on that, but look unto him who has spoken, we cannot fail. Overcomers aren't made, they are born. We have seven promises to overcomers in the book of Revelation. You cannot be anything but an overcomer once you awake to being a son of God. The spirit of God in you cannot do anything but overcome. You are born an overcomer. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The cross is the answer for our condition. For the world situations, all the sin, sickness, disease, and heartache. The problem is that we look at the appearance instead of the cross. I've often shared that if you take a rose and cut it off the rose bush, that rose looks very much alive. But the moment you cut off its life source it is dead. Well 2000 years ago, the life source of the Adamic man was cut off. He may look very much alive to you. The appearance of evil may be all around you, but I can assure you, it is only a false image because the Adamic man was dealt a deep blow at Calvary. Christ was that last Adam. The vision of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. Why do we not experience the power of God in our life? It is because we have not had a revelation of the cross. We love Jesus. We worship Jesus. We go to church, but we do not know the value of the magnitude of Calvary's victory. The cross put an end to everything in the universe that is ungodly. We can walk in the knowledge of that, or we can walk in the knowledge of what we sense is our alienation and separation from God. Many of us feel that way because we don't feel like we measure up. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 teaches us, if you then be risen with Christ, we are already resurrected in Christ. We have the resurrected, transcendent life of God within us. So if we be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections, your attention, your heart on things above, not on things of the earth. Don't look with this carnal mentality, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. I think we all know where God is appearing, don't we? He is appearing in you and in me. We need to be ready to give up that false perception we have of ourselves, and be as Abraham, who considered not the things that he saw, but he considered him who had promised as one being able to do that which he promised. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. 1 John 3, 2. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like to him, for we shall see him as he is. I love that verse, because when you see him as he is, you will be like to him. Why? Because you will see him as yourself. You will see that there is no separation. There is no distinction. There are not two entities in this world. There is only one, and it is Christ. We are one with Christ. That's why Paul said, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. People talk about the human spirit as though it is something separate from God. But your spirit has been joined to the Lord. If it has been quickened by the power of God, if you are awakening in his likeness, there are not two spirits. There is only one spirit. Think of it, folks. If your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one spirit, how could you be a mere carnal human being? 
thing, when the full realization of this hits us, how could we be less than what he is? When Christ shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is for now, not a futuristic event. The man of sin that we perceive ourselves to be is the problem 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. You see, the man of sin is your human identity sitting in the temple of God, really not admitting the truth of your being, as well as governing your own life, and running your own life according to the knowledge of good and evil. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him, whose coming is up to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. What is the delusion? That the cross really wasn't effectual. Oh, we believed in it, but the delusion was that we are still independent beings operating apart from God. Even some of our songs, and I thought of one particular song that says, You are God in heaven, I am here on earth. It is a beautiful song, but it shows that even in our worship we have an Adamic mindset. You are God in heaven, I am here on earth. That has been our concept. If your spirit and the Holy Spirit is one spirit, how could God be in one place and you be in another? Paul said, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places not someday, not after you leave this earth, but right now. So thank God we are being awakened to righteousness. The only reason we manifest all of the traits of unrighteousness is because we do not understand Calvary. I guarantee that, if you understand Calvary as well as understanding God is not holding you accountable for sin, that alone will release you from its grip and its power. It is only in you trying to overcome with a carnal mindset that gives strength to that power of sin in your life. The more you try to overcome it, the more it will have you in its grasp. That is why Paul said, the strength of sin is in the law. 1 Cor 15 56 Do you want to give strength to sin? Put somebody under the law and tell them they can't something. It gives strength to the sin in your life. Who is the man of sin? It is not a man coming someday to rule the earth. The man of sin is that nature that sits in your temple, the temple of God, who declares himself to be God, and who opposes God. You may say, now wait a minute, that's not me. Well, the man of sin will never let you see who you really are. That false identity, that religious mentality that might be lodged between your ears, would never let you see the reality of being Christ on this earth. That is what dethrones the man of sin from our temple. When he, Christ, shall appear, he shall destroy that man of sin by the brightness of his coming. When the Lord begins to arise in you, he destroys that false concept that you have in your mind of being alienated and separated from him in any way. The false image that is only in your mind will begin to fall at your feet. For the mystery of iniquity does already work, and only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. What is restraining the appearing of Christ? It is that false image of yourself, your ego. When that is taken out of the way, Christ shall appear in you, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is up to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. This man of sin, this one that's lodged between our ears that takes the place of Christ in us, can be a very religious person, just because some are out here performing all kinds of miracles, signs, and lying wonders in the name of Jesus, does not mean they are a spiritual person. Remember what Jesus said to some, they said, Lord, we've cast out devils in your name, we've healed the sick, we've raised the dead, we've done all these mighty wonderful works, and he said, I never knew you, we have not had a proper revelation, or understanding of this man of sin, anything in your being that is not according to godliness, anything that you are doing even for him that's not out of his life, nature and direction is antichrist, the scriptures say, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, what is the love of the truth, the love of the truth would be to accept everything that the scriptures tell us about ourselves is truth, the scriptures tell us that we have no guilt, no condemnation, because everything that we thought we were, all the alienation, the sin, all the separation was put to death at the cross, and we are now simply God's sons who are manifesting God on this earth. What else could we be? If he is the head and we are the body, could we, as this body, be any less divine than the head? As far as life and nature goes, there could be no difference. The same life, nature, compassion and ability that is in the head, is in the body. My head is not something other than what my body is. So we have to put down the lie that we are something other than what the scriptures, and what God reveals to us we are. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. What is the delusion in the lie? It is that you are something other than what God is. That is the greatest deception this world can have. For you to believe that you are something other than, or less than what God has has said you are. Who told you that you were a sinner? If you are not willing to see the truth of your being, if you reject the word of who you are, or you reject the thought that you are gods on this earth, or that you are a manifestation of who he is on this earth, the only thing left for you is that strong delusion of the lie that you are a just human being. You may try the best you can and go to church as much as you want, do all the right things, do everything right, and you will still be living in that delusion of being separated and alienated from God, even trying your very best through the knowledge of good and evil to get back to that place in God where you can be one with him. That is the delusion. The work has been done. It is finished. It's over. When you begin to live out of a Christ identity, out of that incorruptible seed, you tell me that Christ needs processing. You tell me that Jesus needed sickness in his body to process him into the kingdom. I don't think so. Yet we have accepted the lie. I've done it myself. Thank God, we are learning not to look at that which is seen through the physical eyes. For that which is seen is temporal, subject to change. But that which is unseen is eternal. Everlasting 2 Corinthians 4 18 I'm going to repeat this one more time. It is impossible for the incorruptible seed to grow up in you and produce a carnal human being. The incorruptible seed can only produce God on this earth. 
Are you willing to receive that? Many times I've cried out to God. I've spent weeks praying to God. Open my eyes. Oh God, open the eyes of my understanding. I knew these things before I ever began to walk in them. Now I say, oh God, open my understanding. Reveal to me that the same power that is in Jesus Christ now dwells within me. I know it, but I want to walk in it. I did not realize for a long time that to walk in it, I had to deny everything that I thought I was in this human carnal person. That's what Paul meant in Romans chapter 7 when he said, if you do that which you do not want to do it is not you. You see, actually, as long as you identify with the habits of sin, the problems, the lusts, as long as you identify with that and say, that is me, as long as you identify with your sickness, no matter what it is, as long as you line up your identity with that which is humanistic, you will not experience walking in the kingdom of God in a practical way. I am not just a human being on this earth. I am the indestructible, incorruptible seed of God. That seed of God cannot produce sickness, disease, separation, heartache, bitterness and resentment, because they would not believe the truth. They were sent a lie, a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now let's stop believing the lie and believe that he is faithful who has promised. He is faithful who has spoken. I have chosen you before the foundation of the world, and you are holy and without blame. I have seated you in heavenly places. I have given you rule and dominion and authority over all that is in your realm. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, we know who the Lord is, Jesus Christ, but he is the Lord of lords. We are his Christ on this earth. Let us go forth in that reality. Amen. The end.